Welcome to Yong Tuition. My apology for not making new videos on climate physics for a few months, although I have done lots of research and analysis over the past few years. The trigger for me to jump up this time is due to a new video published by Dr. Zabina Hausenfelder this week. This is called stratospheric cooling, and it's one of the key predictions that climate models have made. In which she explained that the stratospheric cooling that even bothered Dr. William Harper somehow is caused by the upward atmospheric long wave radiation from wriggling CO2 molecules at higher altitudes. Remember I said that as you go up to higher altitudes in the atmosphere, the temperature increases again in a region called the stratosphere. This is because the stratosphere absorbs some of the incoming sunlight, especially in the ultraviolet. The concentration of greenhouse gases up there isn't high enough anymore to trap the incoming infrared light, but the concentration of carbon dioxide is still increasing. What does this do to the stratosphere? Well, these additional greenhouse gas molecules will still emit infrared light when they wiggle. This means that the stratosphere becomes better at getting rid of energy, which means it cools. But exactly how could this greenhouse gas molecule gain their energy over there? She didn't say, or perhaps nobody knows. If they had absorbed some terrestrial infrared radiation, in the lower altitudes, they would have re-emitted it long before they arrived in the stratosphere. Even if they could directly absorb relatively longer wave radiation downward from the sun and then re-emit it in all directions, how could they make the stratosphere better at getting rid of energy Notice one can hardly find air molecules in the stratosphere and above, except for the shortwave radiation from the sun and the cosmic rays. In fact, the temperature in higher altitudes is actually an effective temperature obtained by using the Stefan Boltzmann law based on measured radiation fluxes, both downward and upward at different frequencies. Stratosphere cooling sounds attractive, but unfortunately, many presenters seem don't know what they are talking about. Here is an abstract from the paper in Nature, published in 2012. A new data set of middle and upper stratospherical temperatures based on reprocessing of the satellite radiance, provides a view of stratospherical climate change during the period 1979 to 2005 that is strikingly different from that provided by earlier data sets. It continues, the new data call into question our understanding of observed stratospheric temperature trends and our ability to test simulations of the stratospheric response to emissions of greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances. So this is still an ongoing research field. Even after half century when Malabi and his colleagues published their climate model. The incoming radiation from the sun goes through the atmosphere and hits the surface. It's converted into infrared radiation and that heats the atmosphere from below. Somewhere up here, the infrared light escapes for good. If the concentration of carbon dioxide goes up, then the infrared light escapes from somewhat further up where the atmosphere is a little colder. So now the total emitted energy is smaller and the system is out of balance. This sounds similar to what Manabi said in English. Don't worry, I have written the subtitles by listening to and guessing his talk 
over again, again and again. Suppose you make that atmosphere more opaque, make it much harder to see the lower layer of the atmosphere than the upper layer of the atmosphere. This means uh, uh, the, the more the opaque the atmosphere, higher the altitude of effective emission layer of the atmosphere. Can you understand that? I, yeah. And so the more greenhouse gas you have in the atmosphere, effective center of emission layer go up. And so uh, the, oh, I just, I just go to next one, yeah. As indicated by the point A, and I'll go upward. Now, because temperature of troposphere decreases with increasing height, so that effective emission temperature go up higher, that means it reduces outgoing radiation. The more opaque the atmosphere, higher is the effective center of emission. Notice, may not be used the term the height or the center of atmospheric radiation to pinpoint a hypothetical layer responsible for the atmosphere to, to re-emit infrared energy into the outer space, originally absorbed from the condensed matter surface with a higher temperature, 289 Kelvin. To be exact, the temperature at this height is 255 Kelvin for argument's sake. Do you remember what do people call it? That's right, the greenhouse effect 1.0, which had been miraculously achieved before the Industrial Revolution. Now it's the Venus turn. When the world died in 2011, Manabe was one of the recipients of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics. This figure from their 1967 paper shows that when carbon dioxide levels increase, the lower atmosphere should warm, but the stratosphere should cool. Indeed, Manabi and Viserot published this diagram in the 1960s, I think it's 1967. But how many people have looked into this paper in depth? Here is a fast food introduction, which is by no means spotless. In Chinese, it means to throw out a brick in order to get jade. By the 1960s, it was known that, in principle, a radiation process in a media can be calculated by using Schwarz Schild equation plus the Kirchhoff's law for black body radiation. Nevertheless, the calculation could be tedious and even misleading. Nowadays, that's why climate researchers simply buy the related software from consulting terms. I know some of these uh, consultants. Menabi and Viserot must know this and decided to have a shortcut to calculate the temperature profiles in the atmosphere. How? They simply use the U.S. Army's atmospherical temperature profiles as a standard to cook their parameters such as emissivity, absorptivity, transmittance for the key greenhouse gases such as CO2 and the water vapor, as well as their mass densities. The master equation they used was simply a power balance equation containing isobaric heat transfer terms and effective infrared radiance at a dozen of different uh, altitudes between the surface and the lower stratosphere. When I say cook, I mean to empirically choose different values for these parameters to fit the U.S. Army temperature diagram as a reference. A lot is simpler than solving the Schwarzschild equation. To cut the story short, they then halved and doubled the CO2 concentrations in order to see if any climate change could be induced. Haha, -ha, they got it. That is what the Nobel Prize Committee used. So I was impressed when I first read Manabi's early papers. 
But after a while, I became skeptic about this diagram. Seemed to bogus to those alchemists in the 17th century. In essence, it would appear the asymptotic value for the temperature is wrong. Look at this. It was explicitly assumed at the top of the atmosphere the power balance equation should be determined by the downward shortwave radiance and the upward longwave radiance. Okay. But it would appear Manabe and Wieselrod simply used the calculated temperature values above the troposphere using the parameters obtained near the surface. If we use a linear extrapolation, we can see their prediction can hardly make sense towards higher altitudes. In other words, the parameters they used to obtain this diagram seems invalid. Hello, are you still there? Wake up, my lords. In support of her explanation, the Bina cited a recent paper showing observational data. Here's a summary of the data from some satellites up there. What happened in 1991? That was the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. But does this phenomena has anything to do with CO2 doubling in the first place? In fact, the data and the trend line show in this diagram are so-called recalibrated results using unspecified models and algorithms rather than directly observed from satellites. Although some early inconsistent observational data were used, I also call this as cooking process. Look here, these differences in temperature trends are due to atmospherical ozone amount from depletion to recovery. So it's O3, not CO2 this time. To my knowledge, both stratospherical cooling and warming could be observed, depending on where and how you measured. To obtain a global mean anomaly for the change in the stratosphere radiation temperature seems as almost impossible <laughs> as to obtain a global mean anomaly for the air temperature near the surface of Earth, unless a real doomsday were coming. According to Professor Q.B. Lu, who published an original and a comprehensive paper on this issue a few years ago, the stratosphere temperature change has nothing to do with increasing CO2. Instead, he revealed that the global warming and the cooling are caused by CFC, chlora, flora carbons, which can chemically destroy the ozone layer, as we told. Interestingly enough, ozone had been a prime suspect for global warming in the 1970s before CO2 was formally charged as a criminal. Professor Lu's claim seems by no means groundedness. Look at this more realistic atmospherical absorption spectra he used, in which there were no atmospherical window between wavelengths 8 to 12 micron can be seen. The sharp upside down peak is the absorption by ozone which is uh, dependent of CFC molecules in the stratosphere, presumably. Did I say KFC? No? Sure? Strange. I heard of it. Okay, never mind. Chairman Mao tells us, I mean, the consensus dogmas tell us, the atmosphere is almost opaque to infrared radiation. That's why in many studies, it has been assumed that the terrestrial radiation can be transmitted into the outer space is less than 10%. By way of contrast, my recent research has shown that 
over 60% of terrestrial long wave radiation can probably be transmitted, at which the atmospheric entropy reaches to its maximum, whilst the cumulative upward atmospheric long wave radiation is almost zero. This is different from the scenario the Venus discussed when the terrestrial radiation is completely absorbed by the atmosphere, as I will discuss soon. Still, I was surprised to read that Professor Liu concluded that over 80% of terrestrial long wave radiation can escape into the outer space through this atmospherical window. I will re-examine this claim uh, in the future. More importantly, or more sadly for some people, it was found that the expected strong CO2 absorption band between wave number 600 to 800 per centimeter is absent in the observed difference spectra. Further suggesting the recent global warming has nothing to do with increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. In line with Manabi's idea, Zabina proposed a novel description. So now the total emitted energy is smaller and the system is out of balance. The Earth then has to heat from below until the emission comes into balance again. And the effective altitude of emission can be slightly different for each part of the frequency spectrum. I believe that those pictures originate from illustrations in climate physics books where the arrows don't depict the way that the radiation actually goes, but just the total amount of energy that flows through those channels. That's to say, this illustration is all well and fine, so long as you don't think this means that the infrared light actually goes through the atmosphere. This sounds like a fairy tale. Nevertheless, it would appear such a simple description can hardly be explained in terms of basic laws in thermodynamics. In the first place, it cannot be justified that all of the terrestrial long wave radiation has been completely absorbed by the atmosphere all the time, at least before the Industrial Revolution, so that the outgoing long wave radiation or OLR is merely emitted by the greenhouse gases. Secondly, Manabi's effective radiation layer or center in atmosphere is imaginary. As the cumulative upward long wave radiation by the atmosphere come from all altitudes, from near the surface to the top of the atmosphere, including troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and so on. Not just those molecules in the stratosphere, here is an early explanation for the uh, stratospherical cooling by NOAA. Not the, the NOAA in the Bible. Said an enhanced greenhouse effect is expected to cause cooling in higher parts of the atmosphere because the increased blanketing effect in lower atmosphere holds in more heat. How can you hold the heat? Allowing less to reach the upper atmosphere. Do you believe that? I don't. According to my recent research, however, the outgoing long wave radiation or OLR is an invariant if the solar radiation remains a constant. In essence, OLR is the sum of the transmitted terrestrial long wave radiation and the cumulative upward atmospheric radiation, which increases with the CO2 concentrations. Of course, the big player in regulating climate are water vapor and clouds, which are changing all the time, called weather. In general, 
the gaseous atmosphere and the condensed matter surface of the Earth as a whole know how to stabilize the surface temperature in respective of the amount of CO2 in air, 400 ppm or 4,000 ppm, as it has been the case in the past billions of years. I will discuss a more important issue, which is relevant to the simplified diagram Sabina's team used, namely whether or not the atmospherical infrared and far infrared absorption spectra in which uh, the CO2 absorption peak can be seen was directly observed from a satellite or just theoretically calculated. This is the original figure in question, in which both the atmospheric window and the CO2 absorption peak centered at wavelengths 15 micron can be identified. Quite different from the figure used by Sabina's video, isn't it? In fact, I was planning to talk about this issue as early as last August, when I personally made an inquiry uh, from a NASA senior scientist. Yes, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, because this is such an important issue that could shake the basis for many published papers on global warming and climate modeling. I will talk about this, so please stay tuned. Thank you for watching. See you next time.